We are tasked this afternoon, uh, this afternoon to talk about the Christian family. There is, this is a very important topic. In fact, when this talk was offered to me by Brother Tony and Sister Biol, we did not hesitate to accept it because we feel that it is an honor, it's a rare uh, opportunity to deliver this talk. Brothers and sisters, I think we all know that in this part of the world, where in all our instance, all are in a hurry, and a lot of pressures from work, and sometimes we will be hot-tempered. My only consolation is when I get home and see my loving wife and my two wonderful kids doing their homework and very diligent in their studies. We also see to it that we will eat dinner together because we miss having it during breakfast and lunch. We shared some jokes and I asked my kids about their studies and any concern that needed my attention. And then when I feel free, I help Rose with her normal Monday with her usual, with her usual workloads, cleaning the house and preparing foods for our daughters. That's our normal Monday to Friday routine, and on weekend, we wake up late on Saturday if we don't have a busy BP activities. And on Sunday, we will go to church together, eat lunch outside sometimes, and then go to the mall and look for a good deal. Almost the same cycle the whole year round. Family also brings back memories of my childhood years in Cagayan de Oro City. Where I grew up with my parents, I have one brother and three sisters. Being a member of a huge family, I remember that my mother always see to it that we have food at all times. Even if our only source of living through my father's major income, we were very happy. We have lots of times to each other and we never not in a hurry. We used to pray the rosary at 8 p.m. after we ate dinner. That was my family back then, my family I know of. I am sure you have food, fond memories of your families as well. Let me now introduce you to my wife, Rose, for her time. Good Before joining this BP, we try our best to be active and participate in all church activities because I really believe that family prays together stays together. Not too long ago, I am sure we can all recall the family was intact. Orderly and loving, more particularly in the Philippines, marriages are considered a lifetime relationship. Marriage and family are counted among the most precious of human possessions. And we all know and agree that families are the basic units of the human society, the domestic church. However, in recent decades, the family has continuously been under attack. Here are some marriages and family statistics and these are very alarming. According to Jennifer Baker of the Forest Institute of Professional Psychology, in Springfield, Missouri, the divorce rate in America is 50% of the first marriages, 67 of the second, and 74% of the third marriages. And, and as a result of this, about 20 million children below 18 years old are living with just one parent. Aside from the marriages, about 6 million unmarried couples are living together. As far as abortion is concerned, as supported by the Allen Gap Nature Institute, there are 49,551,703 abortions from 1973 to 2007, where an average of 1.4 million annually, approximately 3,993 abortions per day in the U.S. alone. 90% occur for social reasons such as teenage pregnancy and some wants to delay pregnancy because of career and lifestyle. 
What is the effect of a single parent home? Statistics show that fatherless homes account for 63% of youth suicides, which is the third leading cause of death among young adults and adolescents aged 15 to 24. 90% of homeless runaway children, 85% of children with behavior problems, 71% of high school dropouts, 85% of youth in prison, and 75% of teenage pregnancies and adolescents from single parent homes. Then there is domestic violence. About 5.3 million women are abused every year. Children are abused in 33 to 50% of families where women abuse occurs. And children who grew up in violent homes have 74% higher chance of committing criminal assault later in their lives. These are very alarming. What went wrong? Is this how God created marriage and family? No. Family is an institution created by God and how marriage and family is becoming these days is surely a big disappointed disappointment of God. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. And Jesus cites God's words. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 5 to 6, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and wife and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become as one. Thus, they are no longer two but one body. Let no one separate what God has joined. When God created man, he made woman. Woman is in fact referred to by God as man's suitable partner. This is what we could call the soulmate created by God. And once a man has chosen his God-sent partner, man will be joined to his wife to become one body. <clears throat> to be one means to be united in all aspects of relationships. Physical, emotional, social, economic, and spiritual. And as the two becomes one, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, God said, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Be fertile and multiply means we are called to participate in God's creation, to be His co-creators by having children. Sexual relations is a gift from God, enabling husband and wife to be co partners uh, to be co-creators. Abortion is totally a defiance of God's law. To terminate a living fetus for social reasons is a deliberate turning back on God's call to become his co-creators. In you is alone, nearly half of pregnancies among women are unintended. And four in ten of this are terminated by abortion. If God has created man to have a suitable partner, and if as a couple man and woman become stewards of the children, God has blessed with them with. What is wrong with marriages today? This is, the statistic rules cited are not all new to us. Divorce and separation have become acceptable option to marriage couple. In fact, book has been written to help kids cope up with divorce. What about unmarried couples living together? Isn't this a trial and error sort of relationship? It is obviously contrary to God's word, and the two shall become one. We're merely living together without commitment 
keeps the two people unique from each other. Two separate individuals who continue to decide of their individual concerns without consideration of the others. It is interesting to talk about the chemistry of two people who fall in love. As David Promoran said to his song, Get to Believe in Magic, tell me how two people find each other in the words that full of strangers. And also in the song, Suddenly, Suddenly, life has new meaning to me. There is beauty up above and things we never take notice of. You wake up and suddenly you're in love. The first stage of love is feeling. Then, as love develops to something deeper, it becomes an act. And act, furthermore, it becomes a decision. The decision to love one other person, no matter what, many would say, I do agree that love is a circle, is a cycle. A will that keeps on going and will move from feeling to act to decision and should go back again and again and again so we don't fall out of love. Let us discuss its aspect of love. First, love is a feeling. It is an attraction of one feels to another. The feeling is mixed with excitement and uncertainty. Excitement to see the person, yet uncertain if the other person has the same feeling. Love gives you a feeling of fullness whenever you are together ang bilis ng panahon. <laughs> and emptiness, whenever the other person is not around, parang ang tagal ng panahon pag maghihintay. Mm. <laughs> we also know how we, how we were when we fall, when we fell in love. We always want to be with the other person just a few minutes from separation. We found ourselves talking to each other on the phone. Mm. A feeling that we were never complete without the other. When, when we were still sweethearts, Rose and I we were always together. We love to listen love song. And at the end of this talk, we will give you a surprise number. Ah. <laughs> it's going to be a dance. <laughs> so, love is an act. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, to seven, it says, Love is patient, kind without envy. It is not boastful or arrogant. It is not ill mannered, nor does it seek its own interest. Love overcomes anger and forgets offenses. It does not take delight in wrong, but rejoices in truth. Love excuses everything believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In this stage, love transcends feeling, more on action. So how do we show our love? I, we're trying to check out this um, verse right here. There's a lot of action words. Overcomes, forgets, rejoices, excuses, believes, hopes, and endures. So I would like um, everyone to please if you come back home, if you go back home or you know if you try to talk to your spouse. wives or your spouse your husband I would like to change this um, the words um, one because with, with I am uh, it is with I am so let's change this I am is patient, kind, without envy. I am not boastful or arrogant. I am not ill-mannered, nor does it seek my own interests. I will always overcome anger and forget offenses. I do not delight in wrong, but rejoices in truth. 
I will excuse everything, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love is a decision. As the feelings of act and love becomes stronger, love becomes a decision. A, de a decision to be with the person, to love the person, and to be, to be faithful to the person for a long, long time. And here a man and a woman makes a vow in marriage. And as I uh, read this uh, to Rose, Rose, I take you to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. I, I take you to be my husband. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad times, in sickness and in health. I will love and honor you all the days of my life. <laughs> so these are not empty words. They are words of commitment. From this day forward, whenever life may bring good times or bad, it is a promise to be faithful and to love and honor the other person the day, all the days of your life. For me, that day was the happiest day of my life, a milestone, a beginning of better life, the best decision I ever had. I can see that we all have pleasant feelings when we talk about love. So far, art has presented to us the cycle of love that is happy, emotionally uplifting, but somehow, somewhere along the way, the uniqueness of man and the woman can come in. Even if engagement had been long and both feel comfortable to each other, differences that enduring in, in the marriage Disagreement is a part of married life. This is when the enduring look becomes sharp and scary. When the hands used to hold tenderly, is raised and fingers are pointed. Disagreements can arise from a lot of things such as career, leadership in the house, money, sex, in-laws, friends, character, and lifestyle. In our case, Art and I had disagreements on how to manage the house. Because I am strong-willed and a dominant person being pampered at home. I am the youngest in the family and very idealistic and it was difficult for me to accept Art's attitude that everything is okay. You know Art, the guy, the yes man guy. <laughs> Art's attitude it's really hard for me to adjust. It's very complacent. Complacent. There are lots of simple things we thought about. Eating, time, sleeping habits, clothing, likes and dislikes. A lot of petty things. Sometimes we realize we contradicted each other just for the sake of it. Luckily, we were never in conflict when it comes to money, sex, and in-laws. Disagreements can be insurmountable, unreconcilable. When the sweet nothings are replaced by shouting, cursing, and verbal attacks, the judge is left with no choice but to grant divorce and separation. Can't this, can't the cycle just keep on going on and on to keep the relationship intact. Let us go back to the love cycle that art just talk about it. The feeling could disappear. The act could become unpleasant and hurting. The decision could be revisited, doubted, and questioned. Where is God in this cycle? 
Does God even have anything to do with this? The love cycle is not complete without God. God sanctifies this relationship, blesses this cycle, strengthens the decisions. God is present as love becomes a vow, a covenant, a sacrament, a lifelong commitment. A marriage is a relationship built by three, man, woman, and God. When everything else fails, God will put order. A marriage blessed by God will have the same conflicts and disagreements as any other marriage. But with God, everything will be in order. Nothing is bigger than God. God can tame a sharp tongue and God can mellow down a boiling anger. Disagreements can be reconciled over a dinner, oftentimes in bed. Marriage continues to be flowing in the cycle of feeling, act, and decision. All this can be possible with God as the couple kneels down in prayer. Again, a marriage is a relationship between man, woman, and God. It is covenant above. As much as man and woman try to make the marriage work, the same is true to God. For God who blesses and sanctifies the relationships. God has a plan for marriage. Let us again read Matthew chapter 19 verse 5 to 6. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. Thus they no longer two but one body. <clears throat> Let no one separate what God has joined. To leave your father and mother is a figurative speech. It is not to say that we live our past life and began a new life. To set aside past relationship and the past behavior in favor of a new relationship and giving it a higher priority. To be joined to his wife and the two shall become one. This is God's call for husbands and wives to unity. To communicate and agree to be one in the whole array of things. In faith, in career decision, in money matters, in future plans, in building a family, and a whole lot more. I felt when Rose started using my last name, Romanos. Tuwang tuwa siya dahil nag-arrive daw ang Rose Romanos, puro ro. The start of being one. This is not to say that Rose has raised her personal self by being a Romanos, but rather she has committed to be one with me in the life ahead. It was hard to manage Rose at first, even as she committed to me, be, with, be one with me. There had been occasions where she just naturally asserts herself, fights for her ideas to the end, until we learn about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. Saint Paul said, let all kinds of submission to one another become obedience to God, to Christ. So wives to their husband as the Lord. The husband is head of his family, of his wife, as Christ is head of the church. And as the church submit to Christ, so let the wife submit everything to her husband. In the Old Testament, we have seen God speak directly to the husbands. God talked to Abraham and commanded him not to eat the forbidden bread. God spoke to, uh, no, that was Adam. Uh, God talked to Abraham 
and lead him to foreign land where God will give him a promised land. God revealed to Noah the flood and the rainbow and instructed him to build an ark. Finally, Saint Paul, Saint Paul confirmed that the husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. Husbands are special blessed and anointed to lead the family. When Saint Paul said, let all kinds of submission to one another become obedience to Christ, he is definitely confirmed that the kind of submission is difficult. I have seen Rose struggle to submit my decisions. After a lengthy exchange of points of view, debates and argument, she has no choice but to submit. I think what makes it lighter for her is the thought that her submission to me is obedience to Christ. The husband can be wrong, of course. Why do you think wives of Abraham and Noah readily submitted to their plan? Abraham decided to travel to a known land leaving behind everything that they have. Noah built an ark so big that people laugh at him. How could his wives have faith in them? How could they submit to their husband's plans? I think husbands are called to do more difficult tasks, more difficult than submission. The wife is, is easily moved to submit to husband's plans and decision since he is assured that he is in God's grace. I believe that almost all blessings in the family are caused through the husband. <laughs> Saint Paul continued in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 and 28 saying, As you husband love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. To love your wife, the husband is called to respect the dignity of wife, to respect her opinion, to understand her needs, to forgive and forget her shortcoming. In most of all, and most of all, to protect your interest with high priority. We are called to love our wives as we love ourselves. Finally, in verse chapter 33, Saint Paul closes by saying, let, et, let, let each one love his wife as himself, and let the wife respect the husband this is what God's plan for marriage is. For wife to respect the husband as the husband loves his wife as he loves himself. As parents on how life is lived, how decisions are made, how faith guides him as a Christian. Children are blessings of God, from God. To have children is to cooperate with God's creation, to be His co-creators. Church teachings, however, make it clear that not having children does not reduce the sanctity of marriage, nor does it reduce our dignity as husband and wife. As husband and wife build the family, we must guide it that the family is a domestic church. The family is a basic unit of society and at the same time a church in it. As husband and wife build the family, the family is, is a basic unit of society and at the same time in the Catholic Church teaching it says, by virtue of our baptism, every man and woman and child is called to follow and imitate Jesus. The family is place where we can become holy. 
Families are not made of perfect people. Rather, it is made of people walking together on the road of holiness. Through the joys and struggles, holiness comes into play. As we learn to forgive, to share, to make sacrifices and love, we encounter Jesus in varied situations of family life. A house is not a home. The song goes. The house may be a mansion, a townhouse, an apartment or a shanty. It does not really matter. What matters most is the family that lives in it. The love, the joy, the understanding, the forgiveness, the respect that surround each home. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3 to 4, it says, By wisdom and how, by wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge are gifts of the Holy Spirit. As parents, these gifts guide us to bring our children to building a Christian family. It is clear from this passage that what is wealth are not the real riches that a Christian family should treasure. Rather, what are truly precious are wisdom, understanding, and knowledge of God's words in the Christian family. As husband and wife continue to strengthen their relationship, there is another bigger task at hand. Raising children. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 Give us God's wisdom. Train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old and he will not depart from it. Clearly, our stewardship over our children lies heavily in the early years of childhood. The formative years is a critical time of child's life when he looks at his parents on how life is lived, how decisions are made, and how faith guides him as a Christian. We'd like to share with you God's wisdom in our family life. A Christian home is where a child finds security, assurance, discipline, respect, and forgiveness. The first thing that a child should find a home is security. The child deserves to have food, clothing, and shelter. To the best of the ability of the father and mother, the basic needs of the child should be provided. The child also needs to have a stable family life. A child's emotional stability is foremost developed from seeing that the family is intact. Most importantly, that his parents are living harmoniously. A child's stability is shattered when parents are always fighting, more so when divorce or separation shakes the household. Then, a child should be provided with education and the future, his tools in his mature age. Let me say that even our health is an aspect, aspect of security for our children as it defines their future. To be able to grow and mature in the presence of healthy parents. A child should find assurance in a home. What is assurance? A child needs to be assured that, his, that he is loved and belongs to the family. The home is where the child should find and not Rejection, where he is accepted rather than pushed away. 
Home should also be a place of refuge for the child, where he will find comfort whenever he is sad or in trouble, where he can open up his heart when he is frustrated, where he can expre express his uh, pain and anxiety, where he can refresh his energies and self-esteem amidst all conflicts that he faces outside the world. A child is a blessing to the family, and as a father, the pastoral head of our domestic church, I found in the Bible the wisdom of discipline. It stated in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20 to 23, My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually in your heart. Tie them. Uh, tie them around your neck when you walk about. They will guide you. They will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp and a teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Now let us focus on the last line. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light. And reproofs for discipline are the way of life. This is what God calls every father and mother to do, to discipline their children, to guide them by their commandment, commandment and teaching as a way of life. The disciplined parents give their children will be kept in their hearts to guide them in their years ahead. Foremost, in my first discipline is to teach my children to love and honor God. As a father, I have accept, accepted and received God into my personal life and into my family life. Here in America, where our kids go to public schools and don't have religion education subjects, we take, uh, we take on the responsibility of giving them the Catholic catechism and Christian values. We always tell them our BCBP activities. We always see to it that we will always say the prayer and before prayer before meals and prayer before going to bed to be thankful for our blessings they receive. Sunday Mass and other holiday obligation are Mass days of our worship. We go to Mass every Sunday together as family. We pray, we always pray the rosary every night before we go to sleep. We try to be model to our children. What we parents show as right and wrong will be our kids right and wrong. Honesty is a value we try our best to live by. My deep Christian faith comes from my observation from my parents. We thank the Lord together, always go to Mass, and we pray the Rosary before going to bed. Since I can remember, they always find time to bless us and pray on our foreheads if we were sick. We also used to do synchronized prayer of the Rosary wherever we are. Saying, I'm sorry, I love you, God bless you, please take care, thank you, are part of our normal day today, day to day conversations. However, we were not spared from tongue lashings whenever we did something wrong. <laughs> we should be honest enough to tell the truth no matter what the consequences. We teach our kids to value education 
and important in money matters. We have always reminded our children that money is not a wealth. Education is. Money for us is merely a means to meet our needs. That is why we never tolerated impulse buying. Most of the time, we buy based on need. Even toys have to wait for the right time. However, we also reward our kids with whatever they like within the budget. <laughs> for good grades or a job well done. My elementary years is was always excitement for me whenever I get good grades or high scores during tests because it would mean going out for dinner in a food diner of my choice. And that was always at McDonald's for the kid meal to me. <laughs> my mom always reminds me that we don't have money to waste except for very important things, such as we are training not to hold money so that we will not become used to impulsive spending whenever we liked it. Now I am like the physicalizer in the family. Hmm. <laughs> whenever my mom buys something expensive, I am the one who imposes to that. All right. All right. All right. Yes, Iona is very good in saving money. Kung magigipit nga kami, kami pa mamutang sa kanya. <laughs> we also teach our children respect, justice, and servanthood. I feel that these are the important aspects of loving our neighbors by the way we handle our personal relationships. My relationship with, with every family member, co-worker, and friends, we try to model our kids that everything has to be treated with respect. We train the kids to respect us, to listen and obey, to trust and have faith in us because we are their parents. We give our kids the chance to speak, we sh to share their ideas, to explain their decisions or act, to show them that we respect them as well. And they, re they ex experience being respected, they learn to respect other people. Justice is closely related to respect. When we respect others, we know that each one should be treated with fairness. Favoritism is contrary to justice. We treat our kids with fairness. The same equal rewards for a job well done. The same punishment for the wrongdoing. Servanthood is helping others in need. At home, our kids are trained to help out in the house. They are assigned different tasks. Ayona really loves to help her mom to do home cleaning. Hannah does dishes and vacuum carpet with rewards. Very good. <laughs> Being responsible is something we want our children to become. Hannah and Ayona are responsible for the studies. There is no need for us to remind them to do their homeworks because they even sleep later than just doing by that. We must realize that our children are children of God. We are only God's stewards, caretakers of our children. And as Jesus taught his parables, as stewards, we are called to make the most out of the gift that is given us. Each child is a unique individual. We are called to help each child harness his uniqueness, his God-given gifts. That is why our home should be the place where the child should find respect. Gone are the days when kids are not allowed to speak, when only adults get the right to voice out their ideas, like before, you remember? Mm -hmm. 
we're not allowed to like join when they're talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you join, then there's something gonna, <laughs> gonna you'll be see yeah. you'll see stars. Yeah, you see stars. Oh my goodness, it's stars. <laughs> Gone are the days that we're not allowed to speak. Yeah, and then fortunately, Art and I both grew up in a family where the kids' idea is here. That's why we apply it in our family. We teach our children to be open. We treat them as adults and consult their opinions. Even their silly ideas are important to us. In turn, they learn to open up to us and share their feelings and ideas. Listening to our children is a way for us to understand them in this new generation. The child should be given the freedom to express his likes and dislikes. I think it is a natural tendency for parents to lead their children to their personal likes and dislikes. I know Art is trying to lead our daughters to find the right path, the good, you know, the right way for their future. I think that we can lead our children to like certain things, but to lead should not be done with force. The child should be allowed to dream and plan for his or her future. Again, parents should not force their children to their own liking. To be a doctor because you are a doctor, or to be an engineer rather than a singer because it is more economically sound. As we learn to respect their ideas, their talents and skills, it will not be difficult to respect their dreams and plans for the future. I remember when, when we convinced Hannah to take up pharmacies for economic reasons, but we felt that she's inclined to a nursing profession. So we gave her freedom what course, what course to take. The home should be a place where forgiveness overflows. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? The son asked for his inheritance, left his father's home to, to live lavishly until he spent all his wealth and became a slave, a, mis a miserable slave. He came to his senses and decided to ask his father's forgiveness. Let us read Proverbs chapter 15, verse 20 to 21. He was still a long way off when his father caught sight of him. His father was so deeply moved with compassion that he ran out to meet him, drew his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against God and before you. I no longer deserve to be your son. As father and mother, we are called to be like God, to forgive. Like the father in the parable, God teaches us to be moving with compassion, to run and meet our lost son and kiss him. The home should be the place where the child can receive forgiveness and support to start all over again. As a child finds security, assurance, discipline, respect, and forgiveness in the Christian home, the child will be able to build his identity his values and his dreams. Firmly the child does define his identity. Who is he as a person? A person with dignity, respected and loved. He knows that he is a member of the family. His family is his refuge. His relationship with parents and siblings. More importantly, that he is a child of God. God is ever present in his life and he is called to honor and praise God at all times. He is able to express his uniqueness, his talents and skills. His identity firm and strong will be the foundation of his self-esteem. In the Christian home, a child will build his values. Pray with his family. The child will accept God in the center of his life. 
in whatever situation, prayer will be his innermost comfort. When the child learns the value of respecting his parents, he is trained to submission and obedience. Respect, not fear, is what drives him to obey. Obedience to parents, to school policies, to traffic regulations, to government laws and God's commandments. Justice and servanthood will build this value of loving others, whoever he encounters in the outside world. Lastly, the child will build his dreams guided by his values. He de as he defines his own mission and vision for life, he is well aware of his God-given vocation and calling. A child can serve God in various callings, as religious, a priest or a nun or a religious brother, as a spouse, and pair in a married life or a single blessedness to serve other people in a specific way. Even a career is a vocation when we become God's witnesses to the people we encounter every day. The Christian family is a God is a God's witness of his love and faithfulness. Husband and wife who struggle through trials, temptation, and disagreement have been blessed by God. God assures us that His presence in our marriage life, we, however, are called to receive God and ask the Lord to be in control to our marriage life. The husband is commanded by God to be the pastoral head of the family. His domestic church to do so Husbands are invited to be always in prayer to receive God's grace. The wife is the husband's suitable partner. She is a helpmate. She is the light of the home. Her submission is obedience to God. Husband and wife become partners in building a Christian family, a Christian home as parents. We are entrusted to be the steward of God's children. As we put God in control to our marriage, we ask God to be in control to our families. We pray that God will guide us as we raise our children to His love. A chain is not as strong as its weakest link. If we are to look at the various aspects of that make up a society and refer to them as links. We will see one of the most important links in the chain of society, the family. We ask God to make the chain stronger and lasting. We ask God to bless this chain and make it useful to build stronger links in the chain of society. Brothers and sisters, I would like you um, all to uh, stand. Um, let us uh, pray together the uh, Christian family. Lord, bless our family with openness, the real communication with sharing, and all our joys and sorrows with freedom. To let each other grow with understanding, to give to each one's need, and of course with love, no matter what, no matter when. Amen. Okay, please sit down. So uh, before I'm going to end my talk, I would like to um, um, share to you uh, my um, surprise number. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, what I'm going to do today, uh, this is really struck me because these are the words that God really revealed to us. And this is the word that you are going also, uh, that was also revealed to you by your, by our spouses. So, um, I would like everyone to, uh, if you know the song, 
I would like also to ask you to sing with me. Okay. That dance, huh? That dance? That dance? Bless Lord this food, Lord, and all the our brothers and sisters who prepare for this food, Lord. As we pray, bless us, O Lord, and this against which we receive our bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, remain eating. <laughs>
Hello. Hello, my best child. Please sing with me. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I will be here. 